Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so our speaker tonight is Vinny Colucci. He is a presenter and an award-winning photographer. He's been an active photographer since 1979 and a shooting professional since 1995. He has photographed North Carolina to the West Coast and North to the Canadian Rockies, along with his wife, Annette. Vinny conducts nature and wildlife photography workshops throughout the year. Vinny is an active outdoorsman and a member of Nikon's Professional Services and Wimberley Professional Services, as well as sponsored MindShift Think Tank photographer. And he is, of course, a Singray Filters technical advisor and ambassador. His images have appeared in multiple publications, including Nature Photographer Magazine, Newburn Travel Magazine, Microwave Journal, and various other publications. He has also authored and co-authored multiple books. His speaking engagements have included Popular Photography Magazine, as well as he's presented at Recreational Equipment Inc., REI, St. Augustine Photo and Birding Festival, Orlando Wetlands Festival, the Crane Festival, and several universities around the country. And so this is going to be part one of a two-part boot camp, so hopefully you'll join us again next month. Vinny, I'm going to let you just jump into the material. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I first want to uh, thank Michelle for hosting and putting the, all the technical stuff together so that you all could see this. Uh, I want to thank Singray Filters for inviting me to speak um, to this audience. And I want to thank Singray Filters for stepping out of their box. This is, I think, their first uh, webinar that isn't geared towards just showing how to use filters. Uh, this is a webinar on learning a little bit about photography and, uh, you know, some of the basics and hopefully it's a benefit to you guys. And uh, you'll see over here on the left of my screen, my email address, uh, along with my website. Um, in the end, if we haven't gotten to your questions, sort of an open door policy of mine that you could reach out to me. I do a lot of traveling. I, I have a lot of different projects and sometimes uh, it might take a day or two to get back to you, uh, but I will get back to you. We can certainly set up a phone meeting or an email back and forth conversation to get, get your questions answered the best I can. Um, I've lived in North Carolina since 1989. Um, you can tell by my accent, I wasn't born here. I was born on Long Island, up actually where Nikon Corporate is. And um, as Michelle mentioned in my bio, I've been shooting since 79 on a serious basis, but in 1995, I, I turned professional and uh, started to do a lot of different things, a lot of commercial work. Um, I had clients like Cracker Barrel, Hatteras Yachts, you know, ECB Bank, Community Bank Shares uh, that I did a lot of annual reports for. And I also did a fair amount of wedding shooting. Uh, but my passion has always been wildlife and nature and evolved to that in the early 2000s as far as being able to teach that as a profession and moving away from uh, the commercial work. And I really don't do any commercial work or, or weddings anymore. Um, I really focus on the wildlife and nature and, and helping folks like you get out and see all God's great creations and actually learn how to capture it to bring it home and share it with your family and friends and colleagues. So tonight we're talking about digital photography bootcamp part one. And um, um, it's really about the basics as we go along. There are um, different things I'm going to cover in uh, setting up the camera and what it does, what it's for, how I make my decisions using those settings, and some examples along the way of some of the results of those. So, <coughs> excuse me, as we get into this. Um, I want everybody to have a better understanding of photography when we're done with this. And um, when, uh, when we get to part two next month, uh, it'll sort of bring everything together. So I'm hoping that everybody that's signed up and or is here live um, participates in the September um, second half of this, because that, that's when it all starts to come together and finishes up what I'm, I'm trying to uh, teach you guys. Um, so, we're sort of going to get started and take a look at 
some of the things that uh, will make us better. Some of our topics, both in the, this first part and in going into the second part is, how do we set up our camera? How do we pick the settings and why? And the most important thing on a technical scale, and I promise, even though my background is, is engineering and physics also, I'm not gonna get techie on you, but exposure and understanding the histogram a little bit um, allows you to bring home the best image you can and uh, white balance and, and of course filters and a few more things that we'll talk about as we get into part two um, next month. Uh, even this image here that I'm showing, um, this was shot with a, a Nikon mirrorless uh, camera with a 200 to 500. Um, notice that, you know, um, I, have, I do have a Singray LB polarizing filter on there. Folks, I have a polarizing filter on every lens. It's my protection lens. Uh, uh, my protection filter. I just find whenever I could polarize even a little bit, I could pull out some detail in the subject or its surroundings. And uh, um, it's been a staple of mine from back in film days. I've been doing that since the early 90s. And recently in, in some cir uh, circumstances when I'm not using a polarizer because it's gotten a little too dark, um, I'll take it off and I'll put a... Um, a Hilux filter on it, which is a clear filter that also adds a little contrast. It's a little different than the average UV filter, but you can obtain images just like this um, once we start understanding the controls of our camera. So now we're getting into some of the nitty gritty camera modes. You know, um, we can shoot in manual, we can shoot in aperture priority, which is a program mode. We can shoot in product. Uh, shutter priority, which is program mode, and a P priority, which is a full program mode. Now, you've heard this many times, professional shoot in manual. Well, you know what? A lot of professionals do shoot in manual. I shoot in manual. But I also shoot sometimes if the circumstances dictate in some of the other modes. And what I mean by that is take aperture priority, for example. Sometimes shooting in aperture priority where you set the aperture, and we'll talk about aperture as depth of field in just a little bit, the camera will pick the shutter speed uh, to get the exposure right. And the same thing with shutter priority. Sometimes you want to be able to hold a certain shutter speed, such as you know a high shutter speed because you're photographing birds in flight or a fast moving aircraft. Um, and then the camera will pick the proper aperture. Uh, and then there's the full program mode, the P mode. Sometimes we call that the professional mode. Uh, and that's where the camera takes a look at the light at hand, picks the aperture and the shutter speed, what it thinks best will give you the best exposure in that circumstance. The trouble with that is, and I never shoot actually in, in, in the P mode, um, the, the trouble with that is you don't know what the camera is going to pick. So you lose a lot of creativity. So I suggest that as you move towards maybe shooting in manual at some point, using one of the other program modes, such as Aperture Priority, which is one of my favorites, um, is, is a way to go. Well, I just want to actually one other point. The program mode, I, I don't know if everybody can see my cursor, but the program mode, which I just explained what it does, is different if you have that little green camera on the top of your dial where you can pick the mode where the camera sort of does the same thing. It picks the uh, aperture and the uh, and the shutter speed to do your exposure. It also in the little green camera mode it picks your ISO. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't allow you to do any adjustments. We'll talk about later, and that's exposure compensation. So for some reason, something's coming out too bright or too dark, that little green camera mode doesn't let you adjust to that. At least in the program mode, if you have to do a full program, you can use that little plus and minus button on top of your camera to make things brighter or darker. And we'll get to the more technical aspect of that a little bit later on in the program today. The camera also has this, you know, as far as you're setting up, uh, if you go in your menu, um, there's going to be something that allows you to look at your color settings. And every camera out there comes out set to sRGB. sRGB captures 256 tone, tonal changes of color. 
Matter of fact, when you send something to print to the print house or you're printing it yourself, you're actually printing an sRGB because that's all our printers could print in right now. Most cameras, and I'm gonna use the word most because I haven't seen any that doesn't, but just in case there's one out there, gives you the option of switching that in your menu to Adobe RGB. And why would we wanna do that? Well, Adobe RGB collects those tonal changes as 64,000 color tonal changes. The reason it does that, it's more incremental. So things like pastels on a sunset or a sunrise are much smoother. Uh, you're collecting more data that you could work on later in post-processing. So I suggest that you switch to Adobe RGB and collect those. Now, it doesn't add a lot. If, you're, if you're, um, your card, uh, your SD card or whatever card you're using in your camera could hold 1,000 images, if you switch to 64,000 tonal changes, you think you're going to lose a couple hundred images in that, but you won't. You'll lose about a third of an image because this is really small data bits. But boy, it could make a difference if you're doing a print and you're really in, enlarging it, you know, over 20 by 30 or 30 by 40. So again, I recommend you do that. It doesn't cost you anything. We're going to talk a little bit about metering methods here coming up because to get to our exposure, um, we need to be able to meter the scene and capture the proper exposure. Now, in our cameras, there's three different types of metering modes, but there's two different metering methods we could use. And it's important to understand both so that you pick and, and choose the right way to do it. We'll start with the metering methods. <clears throat> Back in film days, um, and I, I shot film all the way up to about 2005. I blended in digital starting around 2003. And by 2005, I pretty much had gotten rid of almost all my film cameras and stayed just with digital. But back then when I was shooting film, particularly in studio work, I used to do a lot of what they called incident measuring of, of light. Incident measuring of light is you're measuring the actual light falling on the subject. That's very accurate. To do that, you have to have a handheld light meter. And uh, if we're in a studio, typically you would walk over to your subject and hold the incident light meter up by the subject's face and, uh, and take a reading. And if you're using strobes or some kind of studio lighting, you would fire the strobes, take the reading, and then set your camera um, based on that reading. The problem with that is, as a wildlife and nature photographer, it's really tough to walk up to a grizzly bear and hold uh, and hold a light meter against a grizzly bear's face to get an exposure reading because you're not going to walk away. Um, so the other method is reflective. And although it's considered that reflective isn't quite as accurate, particularly back before the, the 2000s, back in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, and um, it's measuring light bouncing off a subject. Now, a good handheld light, a light meter, such as what I had uh, when I was doing all that studio work and shooting film, um, will also uh, sometimes have a mode where they could, you could actually do a reflective measurement in the field. And the light meter I used to use was a Seconic 503. That actually had a little zoom on it where I could zoom in and maybe like here, the scene up on the right, measure measure uh, an exposure in any of these little spots, but not really practical. Uh, and we did it back then because the in-camera light meters um, weren't consistent. I could take three different camera bodies of the same model and all three would be a little bit off. We used to talk about calibrating our light meters, not because we could adjust the camera, but we would know what to dial in to uh, adjust for the error in them. But I'm telling you today, the light meters in our newer cameras, especially after 2005 to 2007, they are so, they're so accurate, they're just as accurate as any of the light meters we used in the studios back then. So right now, as a particularly wildlife or a travel photographer, the metering from your cameras are strictly reflective and you're measuring it from the light entering your lens to the sensor. 
Um, and that's how we measure with our cameras as far as the metering methods. So this is what we're mostly concerned with. Again, if you're a studio photographer, some studio photographers are still doing this, double check things. But this is what's uh, the way we're doing it in the field, and what we're going to be talking about today. We, we do have a question actually about color spaces. Um, if you're shooting in RAW, does the color space matter as RGB or Adobe RGB? That's actually, well, I was going to try to go back, but that probably takes a moment. Um, if you're shooting in RAW, um, first off, uh, RAW, and we're going to talk about files in just a minute. Yeah. Um, if we're shooting in RAW, it has nothing to do with the color space it's still collecting all that raw data. But if you're in sRGB, it's not collecting as much raw data as if you had it set to Adobe RGB. So um, it's how the color palette will be displayed once you do whatever post-processing you're gonna do and you export it to get ready for print or show, which ends up going back to sRGB. Um, when you go to process the image, but it allows you while you're working on it to have more data to work with, which means less choppiness. So uh, I would say I would just set it to the Adobe RGB and leave it there and forget you did it. <laughs> now, some of you are probably saying to yourself, then why did they come out of the box at sRGB? Well, I do want, and I missed this before myself, I'm sorry. Uh, if you're set to sRGB, it typically the image is a little poppier as far as it looks on the back, let's say, of your monitor. And in Adobe RGB, it's assuming you're going to do a little post-processing. And uh, so it's a little flatter. So in your post-processing, you pick that up by adding a little contrast. If that makes sense. Just seeing if there's a response to that question. question. I think that's it. Okay. Um, the metering modes that are in our cameras today are, uh, and I'm a Nikon shooter, so I have a lot of Nikon terms, but I'll pull out other terms to match. Matrix metering um, and evaluative metering in, uh, is what they call them in a lot of the other camera companies, basically the same thing. Now, I could tell you more about the Nikon one because I've been with Nikon since 95. I don't work for Nikon, but I've been shooting Nikon since 95. Matrix metering, here's how it works. It looks at the scene. It measures the light on wherever you put the little uh, sensor. Um, even if you move it around, where you put that sensor, it's going to measure that light. But in matrix metering, it measures that light. And other sensors built into the camera measures the scene around your main subject. Then it measures the distance from your camera to that main subject and compensates for light fall off. And it does one other thing, at least with the Nikon system, it could be a little bit different with the other ones, but it's similar. Um, the Nikon system has over 30,000 images stored in the camera's computer bank. And it picks an image that's very close to yours and makes a final adjustment and does that sometimes when you're shooting at 14 frames a second. Uh, and the matrix metering system and the evaluated systems nowadays, I used to say they were great 90% of the time. Now I'm saying they're really great 97 to 98% of the time. There's still some tricky lighting situations and we'll talk about that in just a little bit uh, where that doesn't work. But remember the computer is helping you. So I want to make this point. A lot of I, I've had students come on my workshops and say, well, you know, I leave it in matrix metering, but I, I shoot in manual um, on my camera. I put it in manual. Well, the camera, if you're in matrix or evaluated metering, is helping the camera make that decision to meter things out. Now, in the program mode, you know, you don't see that happening because the program mode uh, has an automatic function like in aperture priority, um, but in manual, it's still aiding you in that. So you're not really truly in full manual when you uh, are in evaluator or matrix metering. Center weight metering, 
the computers are turned off. It's not looking at that measuring distance. It's not looking at the 30,000 images stored. Uh, and again, back in matrix, it's also measuring red, green, and blue as a staple color to base all the other color exposures on. So in center weight metering, it's not looking at color at all. It's looking at it at more of a gray scale. And uh, it looks at about 60% of the scene and emphasizes uh, the center part of the frame. So really, not it's not measuring the other 60 percent just that center part and um and back in the days of you know nikon f2s and the a1s from canon um that was as close as it really got for a general metering system um and even though this is in my camera i never use it if i got to do something to look at the whole scene i'd rather go back to matrix and um i just don't see any sense on using center weight metering anymore that's just me that doesn't mean i'm right it just means that's a vinny's way then there's spot metering spot metering again all of these are reflective measurements um spot metering takes just a small portion usually your sensor wherever you put your sensor a small portion of the frame it's typically about four millimeters some camera manufacturers are a little more some are a little less uh and it measures just that and again it disengages the computer in the camera. So it's, you're just measuring that spot based on light, not color, um, just light intensity for exposure. So Vinny, what metering would you use for a lake with icebergs? Lake with an iceberg? Uh-huh. Um, it depends on is it if it's if it's an overcast day i'd probably leave it in matrix i gotta tell you the matrix in in my z cameras and in my when i had i don't have any digital slrs i had sold my d5 and my d850 and went with z6s z7s and now z62s uh, the metering the matrix is so good i almost rarely never come out of it I'm probably on it 99% of the time. So I'd probably shoot it in matrix. And, um, but if there was some streaming light and we're gonna see that in just a minute, if you hold on with that question, I mean, I have an example that's not an iceberg, but it's the same thing. Um, you'll uh, be able to do something with spot metering that might help you. So matrix metering here, here's an example. This was a storm coming in in the Tetons. It's coming in from the left. The sun was actually from the right forward because we were looking at the great Tetons to my far left and I spotted the storm coming across the field. All I did was point and shot. Now I did go to F-16, so everything was you know, in, you know, in focus and uh, actually uh, put my sensor for both focus right along here, about a third up in the scene. We'll talk about why that's important in the landscape a little bit later today. And um, let the matrix base this as my main source of light and then pick the rest around it to create this scene. Now, I did quickly look at my histogram probably and made a quick adjustment and took two, maybe three shots. Uh, that'll make more sense when we get the histograms in a little while. Uh, but the matrix did a really good job. If you look at these two scenes, the matrix metering, this is just, you know, a day in Texas with, you know, those ones are really sharp when they chase you, just so you know. Uh, you got to be careful if you climb into a, a field with longhorn bulls there. But uh, this is just matrix metering. So the exposure was just allowing the matrix metering, and I focused right on the eye, to balance the scene with my main subject. Right in the... Uh, um, Rocky Mountain National Park, you know, some elk, just photographing the elk. My sensor was right there to make sure that was nice and sharp. And where the sensor is, that's where it's taking the metering reading. And the matrix metering balanced all the rest around it. So the matrix metering in, in these systems are actually really, really good. But sometimes you get complex light, possibly like that glacier. Uh, and we see this a lot on things like sunsets and sunrises. So here I chose spot metering. And the trick when there's a, a bright spot, and this could be sun beaming off the side of a glacier, um, if you have a hot spot, you don't want that in your calculated scene. Whether you're doing matrix, if you did matrix, it's gonna try to 
darken that, which will darken this too much. I didn't care that this was a silhouette. In fact, I probably shot this at about minus one or minus 0.7 to make sure it was a silhouette. But I metered with the spot metering someplace with this out of the scene. And it was probably, I'm just guessing, because I don't remember exactly, um, I probably metered someplace in here because it was just about the sky I wanted to get an accurate reading on and then control it by underexposing it to get the silhouette. This was not in my viewfinder. If this was in my viewfinder, it would have thrown that off. So pick a spot in the sky. If there's a bright, bright spot on that glacier, make sure that bright spot isn't part of your metering. Um, make sure that's added to viewfinder and pick something close to it. And this will preserve the detail around the hot spot. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. So I hope that answers um, the, uh, the glacier question. But the glacier question, if there's not a hot spot, matrix metering will do the trick. Or if you're shooting Canon or Sony, evaluated metering will do the trick. Spot metering, this was pretty late. Uh, the sun is already down behind the tree line. This is in the Smokies. I noticed coming, coming up through the trail, a, a bear, so I set up. And, um, and I knew I didn't uh, necessarily want to rely on matrix because the bear is so dark. And sometimes the matrix, if I went on here would blow this out too much. I might not be able to rescue it. So in this particular case, not that I haven't shot this in matrix, something like this, but I wanted to protect this black fur, which isn't fully black. It's, it's sort of a brownish black towards the bottom end of uh, the scale on, on the histogram. But I did, as the bear moved up closer to me, I had a little time. So I spot muted off the grass, someplace here or someplace here to get my exposure, because guess what? As we educate ourselves as photographers, grass is a midtone. And as a midtone, um, I know if I just metered off the grass, that's gonna put that someplace in the middle. And then he or she is gonna fall into the proper exposure. And that's whether you're shooting in average priority or manual. Once you have that exposure, okay, um, the bear should come in with the proper exposure uh, as he came into the clearing. So um, this was done with a Nikon D3S a few years back. 400 millimeter 2.8 was one of my favorite wildlife lenses at the time for being in dark situation. Um, and I was at f2.8 because I needed all the light I could get. It was getting that dark. And I didn't have a flash. With I wouldn't flash a bear coming at me anyway. You might not like that. Um, so was that shot taken at a preserve? Were you safely behind a fence somewhere or? How do you get I was, the book from I was, these guys? No, I was, I was about 60 yards away. It wasn't in a preserve. Uh, I do take a lot of images. <clears throat> I've shot at places like game farms. I've shot in zoos. And I shot and shoot in the wild. So um, that particular shot in, in the Smokies was, um, I don't think that was, that was outside of Cades Cove. It was a trail uh, on the road between Cades Cove and uh, um, headed up north from Cades Cove. I don't remember exactly where, but I saw movement in the woods uh, and, you know, I parked my car and took a hike. Now, I don't violate, you know, I don't try to get closer than 100 yards to bears. Sometime, in this case, he turned and came towards me and probably got around 60 yards. And, um, and I talked to him. I talked to animals. Uh, when I, Annette and I got married, um, she had to get used to the fact that I talked to animals. I want them to know I'm there. And you know what? Uh, most of the time they let me photograph them. If they get a little antsy, then I back away. I, I lose the shot, back away. I never press wildlife in the field. I never step on flowers over here to get to the ones on the back. I, I just don't do that. I don't sacrifice you know, nature and wildlife to get the better shot. Right. Uh, to me, that's their home and um, I'm blessed to be there. And if they allow me to shoot, the better. And you can see he notices me, he looked up at me, but I was talking to him the whole time when he was way back here and he started to turn towards me. It was like, <laughs> I, I say good, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl at that point. I'm not really looking for that, but uh, you know, just good girls, everything's okay. Just photographing you. And you know, if, if he 
or she gets a little antsy, you know, I start backing away. I don't turn around. I back away. I make myself look big. I'll pick up my camera on the tripod, hold it over my head as I back away. And usually they just go do their own business. I don't intentionally try to get closer than 100 yards. So. And Randy says, do you ask for a release form? <laughs> what, was it? what was that? Do you ask the bear for a release form? No, but you know what? I... I have all my workshop participants sign one. <laughs> um, um, and then um, and actually, I actually have a rule when I take people out, like we go to Glacier National Park or Yellowstone. Again, we don't track down wildlife and disturb them. But, you know, if we get a chance to photograph wildlife, my workshop folks, as I teach them, if, if one starts to get too close, I tell them the back behind me. And this way I stay in the front. My job is to also protect them if something goes wrong. And also to protect the animal. Um, but I don't think a bear is going to sign a release form. A <laughs> couple of questions. Yeah. Um, after you set exposure, do you lock it? If I'm shooting a manual, it stays automatic lock. But you have to be careful if light is changing or it's changing because you're going through the woods and then you get a light spot, you might have to uh, you might have to readjust the exposure. So I keep an eye on what was working. I don't look at every histogram, every single shot. I'll take some shots like before the bear got here, I took a, I took a photograph of here, quick check of the histogram. I knew my exposure was good. And as he moved into the scene, I knew it was good. But if he moved to the right and got into an opening that was brighter, I'd have to readjust the exposure. If I was an aperture priority, it would automatically do that. And I might have to adjust the exposure compensation a little bit depending on the light but in general no i there's very few cases where i've just locked the exposure and left it there and then using the mid-tone grass didn't require a certain exposure so to keep the dark fur detail had you spot on the bear probably would have lost detail unless if i spotted on the bear it probably would have brightened the bear a little bit but uh, just a little bit, and I would have had to, to keep the detail, I would have had to underexpose if I was in matrix metering. If I was right. in spot metering, depending, you can see the light changes here, okay? Depending on where he was in this position, uh, spot metering off the bear's nose um, probably would have grayed him out a little bit, you know, um, because it would have tried to make it a little underexposed with the right. black. So I, like when I used to shoot weddings, um, I used to, because film had more latitude, I used to actually shoot at plus one to purposely overexpose a little bit and let the lab bring it back down because we captured enough of dynamic range. But we're going to talk about that when we get to histograms a little bit. It'll, okay. it'll make more sense. And we have some more examples in, against the histogram. <laughs> focus settings. I want, you know, we have different focus settings. This manual, if you're going to manually focus, this single point focus, and this continuous focus. Manual, this is not setting your camera to manual. This is strictly talking about focusing. Do you want to manually focus uh, or do you want the camera to autofocus? Now, uh, there's times that manual focus still works better, particularly in macro work where you're dealing with such a small, tiny change between detail in, in, in a close-up subject. But in general, um, I stay in an autofocus mode most of the time. Uh, I'm getting older, <laughs> I can't see as well. And, uh, uh, and I have a choice between single or continuous. Now in uh, single, the autofocus focuses on a single spot in the frame. And if it's an, an animal subject, it's gonna be the eye. Uh, if it's a person, it's gonna be the eye. and it, locks there and once it locks there um you could actually hold the focus button down and recompose like if you know um, to get a different composition in continuous autofocus it doesn't lock as your subject moves and you track it it refocuses based on the distance to your camera now i'm not saying you should do this uh i stay in continuous all the time even if i'm shooting a single portrait I stay in continuous all the time, but I can't recompose like I could do here. But if my subject moves a little bit, even if it's this cougar moving its head back and forth, uh, it'll continue to track that eye as long as I keep my focus point on it. 
if I have to change the composition, I set my camera where I could move my sensor around. So I've learned to quickly move the sensor in the frame where I want it to get the look I do. I don't shoot and just crop the fixed pore composition. In other words, I don't leave my autofocus sensor in the middle. I move it to where I need it. If a bird's flying from right to left, I move it there. I move it two clicks to the right. So the bird's flying into the scene or, or the deer is running into the field, whatever. So I have a tendency to just leave it in continuous all the time. I've learned to do that and I've learned to, uh, and I've gotten good at it. Uh, but there's still a lot of people, pros, advanced people, beginners. They like when they're doing portraits to go to the single, it locks on and, um, and they can recompose uh, what, they, what they're looking to do. Some of the settings look you, like this. Um, back, well, on focus, do you use back button focus? Ah, good question. Back, back button focus has uh, became really popular because, um, again, they said on the internet, all the pros use it. Well, you know what? I can think of five wildlife pros, including myself, that don't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. You should try it. Uh, back button focusing, for those that don't know, there's a button on the back of the camera that, um, well, let's back up a little bit. If you touch your shutter lightly, it auto focuses, then you press the shutter and it fires. All right. If you change that to back button focusing, uh, the button on the back that says auto focus, it disengages the auto focus on the shutter button and only allows the back button focus to work. Now, the advantage of that is you could back button focus and release it and reset your composition even if you're in continuous autofocus, it reset it, it'll, it'll hold the original focus, provided the subject doesn't move away from it. Or you could hold that button down and track, whatever you want to do. Here's the problem with it for me. And a good friend of mine, Chaz Glacier, he's probably the best wildlife photographer um, that I've ever seen. Uh, him, um, you know, Art Wolf and, and some of those greats. And Chaz is well, Chaz learned everything from me. That's why he's great. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, but Chaz Glacier, um, uh, he also doesn't use back button focusing. Uh, and for the same reason I know, we both happened to teach a, uh, a seminar together in Michigan when we found out we both used a lot of the same techniques, uh, except he shoots Canon, I shoot Nikon. And, um, and the reason I don't is because I like to move my composition around in continuous autofocus, remember I said, so I'll move my sensor. It's almost subconscious now, depending on where my subject is entering my view or exiting my view, I'll move that sensor around. Well, if I'm back button focusing, visualize your finger on the back button, I have to release the autofocus to move my sensor. Then I have to reacquire my autofocus on a moving object, especially birds in flight. Whereas if I use it just on the shutter, I'm holding the shutter button down, and I'm starting to fire in bursts. And then if I have to make a change, my shut, my finger's still auto-focusing and I'm still firing. So I find that it was just better for me to leave it as a shutter focus and not go to back button focus. I did try it and I, I tried it for like six months and didn't like it. I just didn't like it, um, but that's me. I would try it, but I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. And that's what today is about. It's to try things and learn some Vinny tips, uh, here's a tip. If you have two camera bodies or more and you're gonna try back button focusing, change them all. Uh, my wife Annette, when she first experimented with back button focusing, she made an error. She only changed one of her two camera bodies. And then she grabbed a camera body and in the haste of a grizzly bear coming or a moose coming out of the pond, she didn't realize which camera body she picked up and she should have been back button focusing and she was shutter focusing and, and she missed the shots. So um, if you have the liking to try back button focusing or any new technique on a camera setting, change both bodies so you know what you have when you take them out of the bag and something's happening. And then you said move the sensor around. What does that mean to move the sensor around? Well, on my Nikon camera, there's, there's a uh, multi-control uh, on the back. On the Canon camera, it's there's a multi-control on the back. You could actually either turn it on a Canon. I don't know what's on Sony's off the top of my head. On the Nikon, it's like 
four arrows and I can move. If you look in the viewfinder where your uh, sensor is, you can move it up and down, left and right. You could go to the right hand corner, the lower left hand corner, to wherever you want for compositional purposes from the center. And then, you know, you could always bring it back to center if you want to shoot something right to center. But how many shots do we want? If you look at this, how many shots do you want where the whole animals are? Just imagine this elk completely centered. I have all this dead area. So my sensor, if it was right here, um, it would force the elk too far, possibly. So I put the sensor, I set my composition and move the sensor to where I want. Then I take my my autofocus it happens and then I take my shot. Same thing here. You don't want this so dead center. You want to look at that rule of thirds and try to get your subject towards a third of the scene where it makes sense. In this case, the bison's moving into the scene. The elk is moving into the scene. You don't want them moving out of the scene and having dead area behind them. So yeah, I move my sensor around. Birds in flight, we'll see some examples in a little bit. Uh, birds in flight, I move the sensor um, as they're coming in. And it sounds like it's tedious, and it is at first, but once it becomes second nature, you don't even realize you're doing it. You set your camera up the way, the way you're supposed to. Now, let me say this real, real quick too. Practice with your camera at home. Don't come with me to Yellowstone and Grand Tetons and put a brand new camera or a brand new lens you never checked out. Go in the backyard, play with it, practice. Even now, if I'm sitting in my office, I get tired of doing work, I pick up a camera and I go through the settings and make sure I remember all my settings. I want my camera to be second nature to myself. Your menus have some of these settings. You know, there's a single point, there's something usually called auto area. And now cameras like my Z62, you know, they have eye detection. And I've tried all of those. I don't not try these things. And they work pretty good. I find myself in dynamic autofocus all the time. And what that really means on the Nikon system, and again, it's similar on Canon and Sony and Fuji. Uh, you, wherever my single point is, there's... Uh, a grouping of sensors that stay active around it. Here's why I like dynamic autofocus. When I first lock onto the subject, I'm shooting the subject in burst, and, you know, they're moving around either slow or fast. If the subject comes off that main sensor a little bit, one of the other invisible sensors pick them up and holds that autofocus for a while until you get the main sensor back on. Uh, on single point, if you come off the sensor, while you're trying to focus, it refocuses on something else. On the auto area, that means if you have three or four subjects up there, it's going to average the focus among the three or four subjects. We've all seen that where you got three or four focus points that light up at the same time. That's sort of an auto area. And it averages the focus. So you're not going to get an exact focus. I'd rather control exact focus by some of the things we're going to talk about later on this evening and into part two. And then, you know, there's a lot of fancy things in some of the cameras now, like 3D. You have to play with some of those and see if they meet your shooting style. Uh, I keep it simple. Um, I'm going to tell you a little secret you're not going to like. And uh, the little secret is this. Uh, I almost shoot the same way as I shot back in 1995 with my F5 film camera. I haven't changed much because the physics of photography hasn't changed. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't experiment with some of the new features in these cameras. And when you do, uh, you might find a feature that works good for your shooting style. But man, try to keep it as simple as possible. Shutter release modes, we have a bunch. You know, this is a single release where you take one shot at a time. This continuous, this is how I stay. Remember I said I stay in continuous autofocus? I also stay in continuous firing. And I usually stay in continuous firing high. My Z6 II shoots at 14 frames a second. And I'll shoot a burst. The bird's flying by, I'll lock on, shoot a burst. And I shoot a burst because I let that dynamic autofocus acquire and hold that autofocus. And, uh, you know, and there's other modes like in digital SLRs, not mirrorless cameras, those shutters are noisy. So they, some of them have a quiet mode. It's like if you're shooting in a church or if you're close to a bunch of pigeons that might get scared with you, with your shutter release, you can shoot in quiet mode. This self timers, this is all explanatory. Digital SLRs, you know, uh, before mirrorless, 
Sometimes we can lock the mirror up so you don't get mirror slap. But I read your manual about some of these settings. But myself, I shoot with continuous high and continuous autofocus virtually all the time. File types. These are the basic file types. You could shoot, hey, by the way, I shoot in RAW almost all the time. I say almost because if I'm putting something on eBay, I shoot in JPEG. Or I have media credentials to photograph air shows. So sometimes I have a magazine that says I need you to upload images um, right away. I can't wait till you go back to your hotel room and process anything. So I'll shoot in RAW and JPEG. So I have some JPEGs to upload right away to them. Um, and I do most of my work in RAW, in Lightroom. And then when I finish, if I have to do anything in Photoshop, I save it as a PSD. That's just my technique. It's something my, my good friend, Scott Kelby, him and I, I did a workshop with him and Bill Fortney once and, and he just talked me into it. And I just can't change an old dog's tricks, I guess. But you could do things like in digital negative files, which uh, a lot of photographers store their files in. Uh, because it's a generic file. It's not like you need Photoshop to open it up. And TIFF is a really big file, but you can't print in that. So I recommend you work in RAW. And when you export it, to either put it to a printer or you're going to put it on the web, then export it in a JPEG. Once it's exported in a JPEG, don't touch that JPEG again. Only work on your images in RAW because you're not working on the actual file, you're working on a preview of the file. And when you export it to a JPEG, it glues those adjustments to the file to create another image. So aperture, now we're talking about uh, some of these settings. Um, aperture is the amount of light that gets let into the camera. It looks like I might need to speed this up just a little bit. Um, Told you it's boot camp. Um, the bigger the opening, the smaller the number. So if we take a look at it, f2.8, which lets in a lot of light, is this big giant opening. You can see it. And f8 is a smaller opening. As we stop down, it lets light, less light through. And that's what you need to know. And people say, why is the bigger opening the smaller number? Just be reminded it's because it's actually a fraction. When your camera says it's at f2.8, it's really one over 2.8. When it's at f8, it's only letting an eighth of the light through. When it's at f16, it's only letting a sixteenth of the light through. So this will give you an idea of all the different aperture settings you can go to. And our cameras allow us to go in between with fractions of a, of a setting. But by picking an aperture, by picking your aperture number, you can actually pick the depth of field that we see. And that to me is my creative view of what I'm trying to bring my viewer. Um, you know, here's a shot um, at F16 because I wanted everything in focus. If I shot this at F20, uh, at F2.8, it would start to get blurry in the background or around the focus point. So uh, aperture is how you control how much is in and out of focus around whatever you're focusing on. It controls what we call depth of field. So 2.8 has less depth of field than F8. F32 has a lot more depth of field than F8. F16 is the magic number for landscapes for me, because when we get to F22, the lenses start to degrade. So even though you have more depth of field, you, you start losing soft, you start gaining some softness in the lens. So my recommendation is shoot in a landscape, F11, F16, uh, maybe F22. We'll talk about when to use F22 in just a little bit. And just a quick reminder, because there's a lot of information on those last few slides. We're going to send these slides to everyone after the webinar tonight. So don't feel like you have to take notes. Um, we're going to send you a copy. Yep. Yep. But depth of field, it, for me, could be the artistic choice. I pick my depth of field first. If I'm shooting a manual, I pick my aperture for my depth of field, set my sh shutter speed to get uh, get the proper exposure. If I'm shooting an aperture priority, I pick what I want for depth of field with my aperture and the camera picks the shutter speed. Um, and it limits and, and, and you know, your viewers, you get to show the viewer what you're trying to, trying to show them. And here's a quick example. This is done um, on my kitchen table. Uh, here, I focused on the queen and I didn't change the focus point at all. 
all I did was go from F2.8 to F16. And if you look, and this is really close together, it's not like a big giant fence line, but the, the jacks are a little out of focus. I go to F5.6, they're a little bit clearer. I go to F8, I'm still focused on the queen. They, they're a little bit clearer. And at F16, they're all in focus, even though I'm focused on the queen because the depth of field has grown and has pulled everything in. But what if I want shallow depth of field? Get the subject to pop off the page. So shallow depth of field means I need to shoot wide open. And if I shoot wide open, I have to be careful. My focus point then needs to be close to the subject's eye if it's an animal or a person. All right, I forget what I didn't get a chance to look at this. This was at either 2A or F4, but everything around in front and behind is soft, which is what I wanted. The tree is sort of in focus in these plants, only because they're in line with the turkeys. You know, same thing here. I had a cougar coming around a tree. Where would I focus? On his eye. But I shot this at 2A to drop the background out a little bit. I didn't want to compete the cougar with the background. In landscapes, it's a little different. I want everything in focus. I use a greater depth of field. To do that, um, little trick for landscape photography. Pick a spot that's about a third up in your scene and at F16, F11, F16, um, everything in front and everything behind will be in focus, even though I focus someplace in here. Everything in front, everything behind, one third in front, two thirds behind will be in focus at F16. And here's how it works. Here's my camera, here's my subject, 2.8 is going to have a focus range in here, all right? As I get to F16, a third in front towards the camera, two-thirds behind is going to be in focus. So what did you mean when you said softness in the lens when shooting F22? Okay. I mean, I could talk a half hour on this, but <laughs> softness in the lens is this. Your lenses are sharp as someone's around F8, all right? As we stop down from F28, to, to F4 to F5, 6 to F8, our depth of field starts to increase. Uh, when I get to F8, I got pretty good close range depth of field and my lens is probably about its sharpness. As I keep stopping down to F11 and F16, the lens, the physics in the lens, the lens starts to deteriorate. The lens actually starts to get softer, not a lot, but at F16, I have a lot of depth of field. So there where that crosses, I have my best combination of a lot of depth of field and a sharp lens. As I get to F22 and F32, you might find your image gets a little softer because the, the lens is failing. The lens is actually starting to get worse up there, just the physics of how you manufacture lenses. So I rarely go past F16 when I'm doing a landscape. I'll show you an example a little bit when I do, um, not part of this, but a little bit later, I'll have a photograph and I'll talk about when I go to F22 and why. Now, you can see why this is normally a three hour program. Uh, shutter speed, um, shutter speed allows creativity too, but it also balances our exposure. And uh, determining on the shutter speed determines, really determines on what our image is gonna look like as far as movement. Um, such as, you know, do we want a milky waterfall? You know, we can't shoot this at a thousandth of a second because then all the water freezes. Um, so again, like in, uh, like in Aperture, we have one stop increments um, that, uh, that we could uh, pick, you know, one, one two hundredth of a second. If we want to go up a stop, we go to one four hundredth of a second. And, that, and as we pick shutter speed, if we're in shutter priority, the camera's gonna pick an aperture to match that. If we're in manual, we have to adjust the aperture to match it and zero it out. Uh, it depends on what you want as your main, as your main controlling force, such as a waterfall, is a, a looking glass falls in, in um, Pisgah Forest in, in, this, in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. And, uh, and here is a little waterfall that I happened to notice there was some movement. So I threw some leaves in there and slowed it down to five seconds to create that. So we could use shutter speed as a, a creative control also. Uh, but we have to be aware that 
if we shoot too slow, we get this. And if that's not our intention, if we're not looking to show motion, we have to be aware of where our shutter speed is all the time. So if I'm an aperture priority and I picked an f-stop of f8, because that's what I wanted for my creative view, my shutter speed was low because it was too dark, I'm going to get this. So, you know, I've got to pick and choose, either open up my aperture or increase my ISO. Um, shutter speed allows creativity, like this was shot at 1 25th of a second, because intentionally I wanted to see wingtip movement. This was shot at a thousandth of a second. Everything is frozen solid. Both are valid photographs. You just need to pick what you're trying to bring back. You know, when I do air show work, I can't shoot these type of aircraft at a thousandth of a second because all the props would freeze and my photograph would look funny and look like the airplanes are going to fall out of the sky because I froze the props. So I shoot these down between 125th and 1 350th of a second because the props will blur a little bit. But when the Blue Angels come out, man, I push that shutter speed up to a thousand to twelve hundredth of a second because they're coming by, you know, at 300 miles an hour. You know, I can't shoot that at one two hundred and fiftieth of a second. So I need to know these tools and you need to go out and practice and learn what your camera does before you go where you're going to pay good money to shoot. Now, ISO in film days. ISO was uh, something that, you know, we put a roll of film and that's what it was stuck in. Now we can change the ISO on a fly. So if our shutter speed was too low, you could up the ISO to get your shutter speed back. Uh, but just like the other numbers, ISOs in increments of one stop, and of course anything in between, you know, what's one stop ISO more sensitive than, uh, than 50 ISO or 100? If we're at 100, 200, you know, it's, Simple math. If we're at F8 back in aperture and we want to double, you know, go up a stop, we go to F, you know, one, you know, we go to F16. So we can make these movements, which will make sense in just a minute when we get to histograms, um, and make these decisions to make sure our exposure and the creative view uh, that we're trying to get works for us. So exposure used to strictly be aperture plus shutter speed to balance our exposure. Now we can actually change our, um, our exposure, and we'll see in a second using ISO. But our settings are really based on what we're trying to accomplish. We can have a one second exposure. We might need to be at F32 to get that exposure. If we opened up to F2.8, we could do the same shot 125th of a second. So it's all the same exposure. It's just different settings for different creative views. So how do we know we have the right exposure? That all important histogram. The histogram is not rocket science, guys. It's just a quick look at a graph. It's what your exposure is. And of course, the mirrorless cameras now have live histograms and it works the same way. You can see it before you actually shoot. it. Uh, if you have a digital camera, you can tell immediately you got the right exposure. And that's because our histograms on the back of the camera, even though our dynamic range could capture up to eight stops of light now, um, show basically, you know, these five stops. Center, zero is mid-tone, plus one is bright, plus two is white with detail, minus one is dark, minus two is black with detail, such as a black bear, uh, such as a snow scene or that glacier. And uh, that's what we're looking at on the back of our graph. I get people come to workshops for the first time, they've never even turned on the Instagram. So we call it the five stop method. We talked about minus two being, being the darkest tone, black with detail, plus two being white with detail. And ideally, as a, if you're a beginner or a beginning intermediate, we wanna to try to keep that as balanced as possible. They're not all gonna look at that like that. You're gonna see that in just a couple of minutes. There's also something called the six stop, which we don't see. And that's when, if you look at a histogram, um, it's out here to the, to the left and to the right of it. It doesn't show up on the graph. Sometimes there's a little spike or a big spike. And, um, but once you pass this graph, you're going to lose detail in either the white or in the black. So it's important, especially in the beginning to try to balance your scene between those two points. So if you keep within those five stops, your exposure 
you're going to have a pretty good image to work with in your post-processing. This is a typical histogram we almost never see. So do you ever use auto ISO? I never uh, used auto ISO up until last year. Um, here's the only time I use auto ISO. What, if I want to do this, I could, remember I said I like to pick my aperture as my creative view. But sometimes, like those airplanes, I have to pick the shutter speed. So I go to manual, I set the aperture I want, I, shut, I set the shutter speed I want, I don't care what the exposure is. Then I, I put my ISO, I set it at as low as I could set it, like 100, let's say, and I switch to auto ISO, then the camera will pick the ISO that balance the two numbers I want. That's the only time I use auto ISO. If I don't want auto ISO, I could still do that in manual. I could pick the um, aperture I want. I could pick the shutter speed I want, and I can manually adjust the ISO. I could inch it up or inch it down until my meter reads the exposure I want. You could do it either way. There's very few things I do in, in, in really full auto, like auto ISO, but I've been experimenting with that for wildlife and uh, that's been working pretty well with me. So I'm gonna probably start teaching that in the field. Here's an underexposed histogram. I lost lots of detail in the dark and probably into the black, but notice my detail stops here, blank screen. That clues me in that I've got to shift this over. Remember I said this is zero? plus one, plus two. So this is two stops underexposed. So I need to open this up two stops, either by using exposure compensation going plus two or opening up two stops by changing the ISO going up. If I was ISO 200, I might go up to ISO, um, two stops would be 800 and it would shift that histogram over and make it balanced. If I'm overexposed, same thing. I'm losing all my detail in the highlight area. And here, there's nothing here. So this whole thing can move over about two stops. And the histogram could easily tell you that something's wrong in my settings in the camera that you might not realize until you get home in your room to shoot. So I would spot check the histogram whenever you can. This is important. The histogram sometimes goes off the screen. This is just how much tonal data there is. This doesn't mean anything. This simply means they didn't give enough a screen to show all the histogram. We're more interested in the position of the histogram through the scene. Remember, if you overexpose too much though, the histogram, uh, if this was two stops overexposed, I'm gonna lose the detail in the white. So you really have to get your exposure as close as possible and you can tweak it once you get back in post-processing, but as close as possible the first time around. Also, LCD screens will lie to you. What might look good or what might look too dark on the screen while you're outdoors, rely on the histogram, not on how it looks on your monitor because, um, because they do lie to you. They, they just, depending on the lighting you're in, they might look better when they're really you know, too dark. They might look worse when it's too light. Rely on the histogram and know that you got your exposure. Um, leave your highlight indicator turned on. That's the blinkies, the thing that blinks. Look it up in your manual and turn that on. Here's why. Because our histogram from left to right shows about two and a half stops. In other words, if this was uh, you know, a half a stop too bright, I'd have a spike along this wall, okay? But after about two and a half to three stops, it stops reading it. So you might have a histogram that looks like a fit, but you've got this white egret that's sitting in the sun that's blown out, flashing like crazy with your highlight indicator. I leave my highlight indicator uh, turned on so I can check to make sure I'm not missing something that the graph of the histogram didn't show me. So uh, on the dark end, it happens, but that's a little bit more forgiving. So I don't worry about that as much. I do want to preserve my highlights. You can control all of this by either the exposure compensation button, which is that little plus and minus button on top of your cameras, or you could try, if you're shooting a manual, you could do it by either changing your aperture or your shutter speed, or you can increase it or decrease it with your ISL. 
just some examples before we end tonight. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about F-22, I hardly ever go there, but this was a fisheye shot. F-22 is where you start to get starbursts. So if you want a starburst, that's when you go to F-22, um, like in, in this case here. But remember, the histogram is not a graph of the subject. It's, it's not gonna follow the shape of the subject. Uh, it's a graph of the, how much of a certain tone is in there, such as in here. This is a pretty nice histogram. It's a pretty even, this is out in Archers National Park. So over here, you know, the dark area, it's how much of a tone there is. There's, you know, mid-tone, mid-tone greens or someplace in here. I have a little spike here because there's a, a little tiny bright area. Some of the white is up in here from the clouds. Blue skies typically are around plus one. You start to learn what the histogram is doing. You can almost look at a scene and expect to know what the histogram is going to look like. Sometimes you do get a funky histogram. There's almost no pure white. This is sort of a little off-white, and that's someplace in this little data. The black bird with no detail is back in here someplace. The dark area is in here. Um, this is sort of a mid-tone, uh, a, bright, a brighter red darker red, that's these spikes. You start to understand your exposure. Now, for example, here's an underexposed image, purposely underexposed just to do teaching. Um, not a bad shot, it could have been brighter. How much brighter? Well, look how big the scene is compared to the bird. Guess what a bird is in the histogram? There, that bird is about one stop underexposed. Green, remember I said green's about a mid-tone. Here's my mid-tone. So this, if I went about a half a stop brighter, this mid-tone would shift to the center. All this would brighten up, he would brighten up. We start to look at a histogram. So hey, did this shot and I was out photographing birds in flight at, this is probably Merritt Island. I would say, wow, I'm a little underexposed. Let me add plus a half a stop or three quarters of a stop and take a few more shots. Sometimes light is more complex. Here's that glacier thing. I couldn't just use matrix metering here. This would throw off the matrix meter. So I spot metered right in here someplace um, to get the scene. And that's why this is a little blown out, but it's forgiving. You expect the sun to be blown out and the rest of the sun rays came in. This was done, guess what, at F-22. Why? Because I wanted this little starburst recorded. At F-16, that would have faded away a little bit. But I also wanted all this in focus. So uh, I needed to be at F-16 or higher. Our last example, this is a nice scene. I actually used one of the reverse grads because this was actually a little bright. Uh, this was a sunrise that, that the sun didn't peek through, but it gave us a nice pastel look. And look at our histogram. You know, we have a lot of dark area back in here and a lot of really no detail black area. We have a lot of dark area here that's all the purple. We have just a little bit of light area and not a lot of really bright areas, just barely getting towards the bright area in a couple of spots. So histograms are important to, to cue you in that you're walking home with images that are workable. And look at that. We are one hour into the program, Michelle. Back to the start. So <laughs> like, I've got yeah. some questions. I've been holding on to some questions here. So. Uh, yeah, Michelle, I don't know what your time limit is. Mine is I'll answer as many questions as they want. I have no time on it. So we'll just, okay. we'll work through these. And if anyone has questions to add, put them in there. Um, Sam wants to know what part of North Carolina you're in. Okay, I live in the Greensboro area. I When I first moved to North Carolina, I moved to New Bern and I got remarried to Annette 10 years ago and she lived in this area and I came. And so did my kids and my grandkids, they all follow us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I lived there. And it's a nice central point in the Carolinas to get to the Smokies or get to the beach or, you know, get down south, uh, get up to north, you know, to the Virginia area. Um, but yeah, that's where I live. Let me make one point before we take more questions. Yeah. My email is here. Please email me if, if this question, if you have to leave, uh, email me with questions. Um, but I want to make a point that, uh, you know, I've been on a project, so I haven't even had a newsletter going. <laughs> I promised that August I would start one. I'm starting one next week. If you go to my website and you want to receive my newsletter, uh, go to newsletter, subscribe, subscribe to it. I promise you, nobody sees that except me and my wife. 
Nobody's going to get your email except me and your, my wife. And uh, if you hate our newsletter after a couple of months, our unsubscribe actually works. So you hit it, it goes away. So I just wanted to make that a little advertising point, but any other questions? Yes. Um, my camera has the following metering modes, multi center spot slash standard, entire screen average highlight. Could you discuss those? Mm -hmm. um, what make camera is it? Um, if you're still here, let us know what make of camera. I don't know, she didn't say. Okay, uh, that sounds like a Sony system that has a lot of metering modes. Um, the uh, um, I'd have to look up the trans, you know, transfer them over. But that um, yeah, you're correct. It's a Sony. Okay, uh, read read that list again. It is multi center spot standard entire screen average highlight. Okay. Uh, the entire screen uh, highlight mimics the matrix metering, including that first one. That first one mimics the uh, matrix metering, also just slightly different. The first one, the, and I forget what you said the name of it was, but I, I have shot a Sony system. Uh, that first one is closer to the matrix metering because it measures the subject as priority and then the scene around it. The, uh, the other one, which is the entire scene, it just balances the whole scene, but doesn't give priority to the subject. The right. highlight one, which Nikon in the D850, the D5, and now all the Z cameras added a spot metering highlight. The Sony one does the same thing. It measures your subject and the highlight, it looks for a highlight. Like if you're shooting a backlit subject and tames the backlit down just a little bit. So it goes back into the computer bank a little bit, just like the matrix does. It doesn't, Regular spot metering disengages the computer bank. The the uh, if you have a highlight mode on your metering system, it reengages the computer bank and takes some of that data and tames down the highlight. Right, and then the question about the bear shot with the grass. Yeah. Um, he said he's going to redefine his question. Mm -hmm. You focus on the grass and spot meter grass, then lock exposure, then focus on the bear. Right, because in that case, I was shooting a manual. Before the bear got to me, I metered the grass and I set my manual settings based on what I wanted. And when the bear got to me, then I auto-focused on the bear. But because I was in manual, I didn't readjust the manual setting. Right. Because I wasn't in an automatic setting. So it stayed with the original spot metering focusing on the grass. But because that was right for that light where the bear moved into, then the bear was in the right exposure. And then in continuous, if you shoot in a burst with a moving subject coming at you, does the camera focus each shot or is focus locked for the burst? No, it, when, when a bird's coming into view, whether it's right to left, left to right, or coming sort of directly at you, the camera initially, you initially lock onto the bird. And when I shoot in a burst, and this is more effective from if it's flying left to right. Uh, when I shoot in a burst, it locks on initially. Uh, and in that burst, it tracks it with the dynamic autofocus in that burst. So the reason I shoot in a burst is if it misses a little bit, the dynamic autofocus reacquires it. So if I shoot a 10 shot burst, I probably have eight good images. There might be one or two that weren't. But the other reason I shoot in a burst, particularly with wildlife, even if they're not fast moving, it could be a moose, you know, grazing or, you know, sitting in a pond, not moving fast at all. By shooting in a burst, when they're moving, the camera will track the little bit of movement and keep it in focus. Um, but I might catch a facial expression change that I didn't notice looking through the viewfinder. You know, in one of those bursts, one of those bursts might be a little bit better. Uh, using your, you know, and also when you're shooting a burst, one of them, one or two of the images are going to be sharper than the other ones. They just are. I remember Galen Roswell, you know, he's passed away but years ago. Uh, he helped design the original graduated scenery filter. Right. And uh, he was doing a workshop and he set up 35 millimeter camera. He set up on a tripod, doing a macro shot. He unloaded all, without changing a thing, he unloaded all 36 exposures with a cable release. And people said, he didn't change anything. And he said, one of those images 
depending on how wind and everything settle. One of those images are going to be a little bit better than the other 30 or 32. And mm -hmm. so I, I shoot in bursts just because of some of that concept. And then a couple of comments referring back to earlier questions. Yep. Um, change the focus point on a cannon by selecting the small red rectangle. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was in reference to a very specific question we had early on. Okay, thank you. And then a tip on a Nikon camera on continuous focus, you can compose, then set autofocus on, and then autofocus lock move. And then you can use continuous focus and compose. Absolutely. Again, because of only having an hour, an hour, I can't go through every feature mm -hmm. of the camera. But yes, a lot of cameras, most of them on the Nikon, you know, which I do know, you could hit, you could have your autofocus lock button set in the back. So you could autofocus lock, hit that button, and then move the camera for composition and fire. Right. And then this is kind of what you said earlier about having different camera setups. Um, he said, I agree on the back button focus. I find it's good for landscape, but not movement. I've set one camera back button focus and the other on focus. As long as you remember which camera you pick up when, <laughs> when, when, when a bear is coming into the field. You know, if you got a grizzly bear coming at you, you don't want to fumble with your cameras. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And then someone has a Sony and she wants to know, how do you move the sensor? Um, I'd have to look that up. If you email me, I will find that for you. Send me okay. your model number. Okay. And Send if anybody model. wants to be on that email chain, just email me. You know, if you have a Sony, do the same question. I will take the group emails and, and send back the answer. I just don't remember right offhand. If I had a Sony in my hand, <laughs> you know, it's impossible to memorize. Yeah, you can't remember all of them. All of them right offhand. But yes, you could do it because... Sony had sent me about 10 grand with their equipment when they wanted me to switch. Great stuff. But I've been shooting Nikon so long that I just, you know, there's no need to change. It does, it's not going to make my pictures any better. It's just I'd have to learn a whole new system over again. But right. really great system. On continuous mode, do you set at release, focus and release, release and focus, or focus? On continuous mode, I set it on release because I'm going to rely on the autofocus of the camera and I'm going to rely on the dynamic autofocus within a shot to lock on to the subject and hold it. And it does. Like I said, if I, if I do a burst 10 shots, eight of them, sometimes nine of them are all in. Sometimes one or two, sometimes even three towards the end. You know, the butt shot when the bird's flying away, I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. but as I follow through, yeah, maybe I lost that one. But the, um, um, I leave that on, on release. Now, in the portrait mode, even though I don't shoot in, in single, I do have that set to focus because that's the whole point of the single is that I could shoot a portrait and it locks on and stays there. Right. And then someone asked the date for boot camp part two. It's on the screen. It's September 30th. So seven o'clock Eastern time. So we hope yep. you'll join us for part two. We've still got a few more questions here. Do you no, open no, your no. nest and use capture ND or I'm sorry, capture NXD as your raw converter? Uh, actually, I do everything in Lightroom now, but I am experimenting with the new uh, um, uh, NX Studio, which looks really good. Um, okay. And the reason I, I stay with the reason I stay with Lightroom and uh, Photoshop is because I'm on the monthly, you know, uh, subscription. Uh, they seem, with the exception of Nikon themselves, obviously, but a Nikon camera, they seem to be the fastest uh, group to get um, when somebody comes out with a new camera to, to get the. Uh, uh, the information from that company, whether it's Nikon or Canon or Sony or Fuji, uh, plug-in working uh, so I could open those raw files right away. Now, meanwhile, uh, you know, if, if I don't have that into the uh, workflow of Lightroom and 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 photo and, and Photoshop, I, I do use the Nikon raw converter in like you know the DX. But again, I'm starting to experiment with the new studio software that came out last year and it looks really good. Here's one of the things, Nikon NX, the original NX stuff that was really great stuff was designed by Nick Software before Nick sold out to Google. 
and long before now, Nick is back on their own again. Um, so Nikon was um, relying on a third party software development team. That's they just Nikon didn't drop that stuff. Um, Nick got sold out and said, we're not going to support Nikon anymore uh, as a private label thing. So Nikon, uh, the NX studio they came out with, Nikon put together an, their own IT team. And for the last, you know, eight years has been developed into a powerhouse. And this new software that came out is really good. It almost makes me feel like I wish that was around and I didn't start with uh, the other stuff. Um, I don't know. I might change to it. It's really that good from what I could see. I'm just not used to it yet. I wouldn't try to teach it yet, but um, maybe by next year, maybe by next year. They did a really good job on it. Can a DOF chart help you to see the difference in aperture settings? Say that again. I'm sorry. Can a DOF or DOF chart make you see, help you see the difference in aperture settings? Um, right. Not quite sure what. I might not mean. be reading that right. Yeah. <laughs> so Lance, if you're still here. Oh, I think yeah, if, they, if they have the chart and they photograph the chart. Yeah. Um, the chart is, is, you know, which is depth of field chart, you would see the change in depth of field, yes. Um, it's sort of like what I did with the playing cards because I thought it was more fun to show it that way. Uh, but another way you could check your depth of field and you'll see, you know, you know when I, Annette bought me, and I'm not really a macro photographer per se, but nine years ago, she bought me a macro lens, really great lens. And I wanted to test it and I did it to check the depth of field of the macro lens, I put a subject, I made a big S curve on the floor with something really colorful to photograph, M&Ms. <laughs> I made a big S curve with M&Ms. And then I picked a third up in the scene and I focused on an M&M with my tripod. And then I changed the depth of field and you could watch it grow from F2.8 because it was a Nikon uh, 105 macro lens. So from F2.8 to F16, you know, obviously I went to F22 to see what would happen. Uh, but uh, at FC, you could see the depth of field grow, sort of like my chart's better than yours because when I was done, I was able to pick up the M&Ms and eat them. You couldn't do that with the depth of field chart. Uh, uh, the bad part of telling jokes in a webinar like this is I can't see anybody <laughs> laughing. I can hear a snicker from the shop. Just but, me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's what that chart will do. It will do the same it thing. Me one. <laughs> you, you would be able to see the depth of field grow or shrink. And it's a good way to learn your lens. Go find a fence line someplace. Don't do this though. I tested a new telephoto lens in my front yard. I want to see how it worked. And I noticed that all my neighbors, they pull their shades down when they see me out there with that big lens. They got a little scared what I might've been looking at. Uh, go, to, go to a field someplace, practice with your lenses, see what they do. And uh, next month, one of the things we're going to look at is different focal lens. And you're going to see you know, the same subject shot with, you know, 50 millimeter lens all the way out to 600 millimeters. You're going to see examples of that. Um, yeah, we, we'll show that uh, in part two. So we have a comment uh, referring to something you said earlier, light bending or diffraction at small apertures causes the softness in the image, usually noticeable above F18. So just... I think agreeing with something you said earlier. Right, right. Um, when, when, and you then, above, and when you get above F16, you get to F18, particularly F22, because of that, um, the, the optics starting to degrade, you're going to start to see softness, even though your depth of field is still growing. Uh, you're going to see softness in most lenses. I say most lenses because there were some really good view camera lenses that shot really well at F45. You know, but they were designed a little different than what we're using today. Yeah. And then you touched on this. Do you use auto ISO to help get proper exposure? Uh, yeah. I, I, what I said, the only time I use auto ISO to get uh, proper exposure, when I shoot in manual, I pick the aperture to get my creative view. So let's say I wanted F2.8 because I want all the trees in the background to fall away from my subject. And then I pick, but the subject is moving around, hopping around, it's a kangaroo. So I, so I might pick, you know, I wanna be at a thousandth of a second. Well, I don't know what my exposure is. 
right there and I'm not going to be able to dial it in uh, because I wanted that shutter speed and I wanted that aperture. So by switching, I could either increase my ISO manually until it zeroes out the meter or I could flip it to auto and it'll just find the right ISO to make my two settings work. And then I could fine tune that a little bit with the plus and minus exposure compensation button. Do you use hyperfocal computation or just the one third for expediency? The answer is I used to. In fact, back in okay. film days, we used to have those markings on the lenses. But I got together with a good friend. He's a, you know, a, a Singray uh, person also, uh, Tony Sweet. And I taught a workshop with Tony Sweet early on in my teaching days, early 2000s. And he said, you know, we sort of going back and forth, being um, a physics background before I learned to make less money in photography and <laughs> stop being a design engineer. Uh, we, we have figured out and really Tony for me pioneered it about a third up in the viewfinder will simulate hyperfocal focusing when you get up past F11. Now, you gotta be careful with that because if you happen to have a tree, a tree branch that's close to the camera that happened to fall into the scene and land at that third mark, that's not what you focus on. Because ideally, you're trying to focus a third into the scene. But how do you tell a third into the scene when, when the mountains and the Grand Tetons are miles away? You can't. So by using that third mark um, in the scene and finding something to focus on, I promise you everything will be in focus. Go try it. Go prove me wrong. So I can get correct. Back to the air show photos. Mm -hmm. Do you spot meter at an air show when you have Shot a them all in matrix that? metering? All in matrix <laughs> metering. And here's why it was the aircraft. Uh, the matrix did a good job. I did shoot those at plus 0.7 most of the time because even the matrix, depending on if it was a white sky or a blue sky, but with the blue sky, just to make sure it didn't darken the aircraft where I lost detail on the aircraft. In the old days of the old TTL, basically um, through the lens metering, when we, when we use center weight metering, I used to shoot air shows with film. I used to shoot a plus one to make sure that I got the airplane. But the matrix does a pretty good job at about plus 0.3 or plus 0.7 when I'm shooting um, airplanes against a blue sky. And that just comes with experience. Let me say one other thing about experience for those that are still with us. Um, I do, you know, back in film days, I was the crazy guy in the doctor's office tearing out sheets. I, I had folders on landscapes, on mountains, on brides, you know, on, on, on seascapes, so I could learn composition. So I could learn composition where if I was going to the mountains, I'd review all my favorite mountain pictures so that I could start mimicking. That's how I learned back in the 70s. Um, in digital, if you go do a shoot, let's say I, I, I took you to, you know, uh, Merritt Island in Florida, you did a shoot and you had like a half a dozen images that were outstanding. You'd still have your Merritt Island folder from the shoot, but you could make a copy of those images into a learning folder. You have a great sunrise at Cocoa Beach. How did I get that? You know, you sort of have to remember that you use, you know, a Singray filter to, you know, graduated filter to, to balance things. But you could go back and look at your metadata and say, oh, yeah, there's my starting point. I need to be here to silhouette, you know, the dock and get a really pretty sunrise to get things going. Educate yourself when you get good stuff. Look at what you did right. Don't just look at what you did wrong. Look at what you did right and create a teaching folder. If you go into the mountains, you could pull the two or three favorite mountain sunsets scenes that you have in your teaching folder and sort of refresh your memory. Here's the difference. I shoot 50, 60,000 images a year. Most non-professionals don't, even if they're advanced, even if they're a better shooter than me because they're just better. You know, they might shoot a third of that. So you don't have a camera in your hand every single day like I do. And uh, so it's hard to remember all these settings, but you could create little training folders, that, you know, review, just like going back to school. You got to review before you take a test. If I'm taking you up to the Canadian Rockies, man, you should review before you go up to that test because that's a big chunk of money to go with me someplace and you forget how to set your camera. Now I'm there to help you get it right. 
but it's sure nice if you're a little bit familiar with the stuff. Right. What metering mode would you use on the Milky Way? Uh, on the Milky Way, I leave it in matrix, not because of anything. I guess you could go to that, you know, center weight meter because it really, it really doesn't matter because I go into manual mode, I take the auto ISO off, I zip it up to like ISO, you know, 2000 or 2500. And um, I do my Milky Way calculation and I put, I've been using the Singray Astro filter, which takes a lot of ambient atmosphere light out, filters it out to get a really clean shot of the Milky Way. You showed a one lighthouse shot that was in there. Uh, of that Milky Way shot that was done with the uh, Singray Astro filter. And, and then I do the calculation depending on my focal length for what my exposure needs to be in bold. You know, um, yeah. you know, is, is it a 20 second exposure? If it's over 30 for some reason, then, then, you know, I have to go to bold, but you can go up to 30 seconds at all cameras. Now the Nikon Z62, and I, we believe this is Nikon Z72, uh, my Z62 can now do long exposures without going into bowl up to 900 seconds, which is awesome. And I believe the new Canon um, mirrorless could do the same thing. Okay. And then John wants to know, do you bracket any shots? I have found myself doing it more to make HDRs. All right. I don't shoot HDR. Now, I have used HDR software sometimes to do tone mapping. That's where I take a single image. Uh, and I do do HDR for teaching purposes, but um, if you're going to do HDR, then um, what I do is I go into, into uh, you know, like every, you know, one stop at a time and, and just fire off 10, you know, 10 shots at a stop apart. And uh, you could say, I haven't done it in so long. I have to remember how to do it in an icon system. You could go in, go it into, uh, um, where it automatically, you have to email me on that. I have to look that back up. I, I'm right. embarrassed, I don't remember. But you could put in like up to nine shots and say, hey, I want them a half a stop apart or a third of a stop apart or a stop apart and just hold the shutter down and it'll fire off the, the 10 images, the nine images, and you'll have a collection for your HDR. I have done that. I just haven't done it in so long because I don't do that often. Uh, I'd have to review that myself of how to do the setting in my Nikon camera. And Doug said, my question is sometimes when shooting my D810, when mm -hmm. pushing the shutter, nothing happens. Example, shooting a sunset on the ocean, the shot I want the most very near the end, the camera refuses to shoot. And he's using the back button. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with that. Chances are, assuming nothing's going wrong with the camera. D810, fabulous camera. Right. Um, you know, I was shooting that before I went to the D850. Uh, there's a buffer. If you're doing a lot of shots, you got to be, it's big files. You know, one of the problems with big files, and I, I, I'd have to look up the D810 again. Um, it only did about a dozen shots before the buffer loaded up. So you got to be careful those last couple of shots. You might run out of buffer, and then you got to wait for the camera to catch up before it'll fire off another shot. You know, the D850, I think, shot. I know my D5 shot like 35 Aurora images. Um, right. And my D my D, my Z62, I could shoot 100 raw images in a burst at 14 frames a second before the buffer loads up. So check what your buffer could handle and make sure you're shooting under that buffer for that last great shot. And then a scenario for you, assuming you're walking down a path in the woods and suddenly you hear a moose coming right at it and it comes out of the woods and runs across the road. What settings do you have your camera set on to get a decent quick grab shot? That's a great question. My go-to setup and my go-to setup is whenever, and I'll talk about that in a second. My go-to setup is the camera wide open. So if it's uh, right now, I'm carrying the Z62 with the 500 PF, which is a 5.6 lens. So that's wide open. Uh, it's either on a tripod or over my shoulder while I'm walking through a woods, probably over my shoulder. Um, and I'm on matrix metering. I'm on, um, if, if, I, if I'm in manual with the auto ISO, it'll pick the ISO for the light um, that I need. And I'll have my uh, shutter speed set at one 
eight hundredth of a second. That's just my favorite. Sometimes one six fifty, just someplace up there. And again, my aperture is wide open. So if I have to shoot quick, I rely on the matrix metering for the exposure. And uh, if I'm not using auto ISO and I'm using, let's say, aperture priority, uh, again, wide open, and I have the ISO set high enough that my shutter speed is going to float somewhere around one eight hundredth of a second. Right. Okay, and last question of the night. You mentioned a Canon shooter with whom you taught a workshop. Who was it? Chaz or Charles Glacier, G-L-A-Z-I-E-R. Uh, look up Shoot the Light. That's, that's the name of his workshop programs is Shoot the Light. Um, Google that and it'll take you to a site. If you get to talk to Chaz, he likes, you know, that's his nickname, Chaz. Tell him Vinny sent you. He lives... I don't know, 75 miles from me. You know, he lives up where all the waterfalls are. So uh, him and I have become good friends. Um, and he's a great workshop leader. He does, you know, I stay pretty much within the United States. He does a lot of Alaska trips. In fact, next year, Annette and I just might go with him just to hang out with him. Right. And, uh, but he is a really good wildlife photographer. You should look at his stuff. All right, that's it for tonight. So, Benny, thank you so much for your time. I hope everyone is going to come back for part two. We're going to dive deeper into photography, um, kind of using this as a, a jumping point. Yeah. So, join us September 30th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And again, Benny, just thank you for your time. I know you're super busy shooting. So, thank you. You are quite welcome. And thank you all for joining us. Okay. Did you stop the recording? I'm trying to figure that out now. I forgot where we did it. Stop. I think it stopped. Okay, look for the Zoom app. I can edit the stuff out of it. And Thank I you for rolling with me.